I see that we have seven people so far. We're going to wait a little bit longer until we have a couple of more. We had, I think, 20 sign up. So I'm going to give everyone about a couple of minutes. Okay. Just got two more, three more, four more. We're up to nine people. Again, we'll wait a couple more minutes. Then I will introduce myself and then I will get into my presentation. I will talk for about 50 minutes and then I'll open it up for questions. But if you have a question, you should, you, you can also put it in the chat function and I will look at those at the end. Okay, give it another 25 seconds, thereabouts. All right, now we're up to 11. I am going to start. I'll introduce myself first. Um, and the reason why I look down because I have this big camera in front of me and I can't see my screen. So my name is Gary Altman. I am the uh, principal attorney at my law firm called Altman Associates. We are the vision of Frost Law. Um, Frost Law is actually located on Best Gate drive near the mall in, in Annapolis. Um, and so I spend my part, part of my time here in North Bethesda, Maryland, and another part of my time in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, my part of Frost Law is purely estate planning. That's wills, trust, probate, trust administration. I've been doing this for a long time. And we try to develop a relationship with all of our clients to understand who they are, what they want to accomplish and what's the best way to do that. I, I developed a presentation. I call it to trust and not to trust. A lot of questions people ask me is, do I, what is a trust? Do I need a trust? And so this presentation is going to just talk about a bunch of different types of trust and whether they're good or not, pros and cons. And then you can, um, again, like I said, ask me questions. I will do that at about 620. 
All right, so I'm gonna screen share right now. Hold on, I think I did that wrong, hold on. There we go. Okay, I hope you can see this. So again, the presentation, uh, fancy name, we're gonna get right into it. So the, the first trust that most people ask about is called a revocable trust or a living trust. And a revocable trust is one to which the grantor transfers all of their assets during their life. And it's ignored, oh, sorry, I'm having problems, it's ignored for um, all income taxes, estate tax purposes. And basically what a revocable living trust is, is designed to avoid the probate process and make it easier when someone dies and makes it easier when someone's alive to manage assets. It does nothing other than really that. Inside of a living trust are all the same provisions one would have for a will, but they're in a trust. Um, and so we can do um, tax planning. Um, we can provide for continuation of investment management inside of a living trust. Um, again, there are certain types of trusts that are inside of a living trust. We're going to talk more about those later. And here is just sort of a diagram. Again, a, all a trust is is like a big bucket to hold your assets. The way it works is you want to. Um, you have to transfer all of your assets to the revocable trust. That means we do a deed to your house. We contact your investment advisor, your financial planners like Bestgate Wealth, and we tell them how to transfer the assets into the trust. People ask me, well, why can't I just do the same thing of avoiding probate by having joint property with my children or by having my uh, financial account transfer on death, TOD to my children, or POD to my children, or some other technique to avoid probate. And the simple answer is, is that those techniques don't always work the way you think they're gonna work. Um, the most basic example is if you do your investment account, transfer on death to your three kids and one of them dies before you, it is likely that the assets will just go to the two kids and your, the, the, the children of your deceased child will get nothing. Moreover, if all of your assets are directed in these ways, who's going to pay your funeral expenses? Who's going to pay for your final income tax return? Um, who's going to pay your debts? Who's going to pay your specific bequests? I've had people come to me who have very specific bequests in their will, but all their property is transfer on death to someone. It doesn't work. The best way is through a living trust, this bucket concept to make sure all the assets flow into the bucket and then back at the bucket to where you want them to go. And then besides revocable trust, there are irrevocable trusts. An irrevocable trust is a trust that you cannot change the words. That's what makes it irrevocable. And so generally, you can't modify, you can't change it. And when you create a living uh, irrevocable trust, you are going to give up legal ownership of the assets. You're going to give it to the trust. The trust is going to control it. And then the question is, who's going to be the taxpayer? And strange as it may be, in an irrevocable trust, I get to decide who the taxpayer is. It can be the trust. It can be the person who creates it and it can be the beneficiary. It all depends on the terms of the trust. And why do we do irrevocable trust? Well, typically it's to avoid or minimize an estate gift, income tax, a generation skipping tax, or it's to control a gift or inheritance. If you have a special needs child or a child who spends money, or you, or you have a child who you wanna protect from predators and scams, or you want to control it for some other reason, that's why you're going to do an irrevocable trust. Either 
when you make gifts now or potentially inside of your irrevocable trust or will. The third reason why you create irrevocable trust is to protect the gift or inheritance from bad things that can happen to the beneficiary. Every one of us has heard about someone losing their assets because they got sued or they went into a nursing home or they went bankrupt or they got divorced. Putting your child's inheritance inside of an irrevocable trust protects it from all those horrible things. And you can even have the beneficiary as the trustee and it will still work. Now, I just said we're irrevocable trusts. You can't change the words and that's true, but you can actually change an irrevocable trust. You can do it by going to court. That's called a reformation or a modification. You can have words in your trust document to allow someone to change it. And then there's what's called a non-judicial settlement agreement in decanting. And the question would be, why would you do these things? You would do these things because the trust no longer works. Okay? So recently we reformed the trust because it needed to be a special needs trust, and it wasn't. And it needed to be a special needs trust so that the beneficiary can get certain benefits from the state of Maryland. We also reformed the trust recently. Hey, Gary. To, yes. Um, your slides look a little bit oversized. Are you able to decrease the size of them a little bit? Oh, uh, good question. I don't know. They're not showing up. The, the entire slide is not showing. Huh. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, I appreciate that. I'm happy to pull them up as well if that's better. Oh. Okay. Well, that's probably better. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, it's funny. I do a I do a meeting every week where I use slides, and I never have that problem. So who knows why? Okay. Thanks for but everything. Thank you, but thank you for breaking in. I appreciate that. One thing I've learned is I can't use chat while I'm on PowerPoint inside of a present Zoom conference. Um, so another time we did a uh, recently reformed our uh, trust was um, the beneficiary lives in Spain. And if the beneficiary in Spain receives an inheritance from the U.S., there's going to be a tax in Spain. And then each year there's a wealth tax in Spain. So we are modifying the revocable trust that the father created and the irrevocable trust that the mother created so that, so that the this child's inheritance will end up in an irrevocable trust for her, which she can't control because again, the Spanish law would say if she controls it, we're gonna tax it sometime either when you get it or each year as a wealth tax. So um, another time we recently reformed the trust because the beneficiary wanted to be able to clearly direct where the money went when he died. It didn't have clear direction. Um, we reformed one last year because um, if we let it stand, there would have been a million dollars of Maryland estate tax when the first spouse died. And I'm, that wasn't what they wanted. So we, so we reformed that trust so that we would not have the million dollars worth of estate tax when the first spouse died. All right, standalone IRA beneficiary trusts. So again, this is an irrevocable trust that gets funded at your death because, because it's a beneficiary of all a part of your IRA, okay? The first question you're gonna ask me is, well, does this mean that the money gets taxed sooner? And the answer is no. 
Under the IRA rules that exist right now, most beneficiaries have to take out an IRA over 10 years. That is true for an IRA beneficiary trust. If your beneficiary has special needs, it's taken out over their lifetime. Whether if you give it directly to the beneficiary, which would be wrong, or into a special needs trust for the beneficiary. So the there is no negative income taxation by doing this. Okay. So you do these things for the same reasons why I would do an irrevocable trust for any beneficiary, because they have special needs, because I want to protect from divorce, because I want to protect from creditors. I want to protect them from their own spending. I want to make sure there's investment management, so we're going to have an investment manager. I want to control it for some other reason. Or there's some reason why I want to put the money into a trust. If my child is perfect, he's never going to get sued, never going to get divorced, never going to go bankrupt, never going to have any problems, then you can have it outright to that child. Or if it's a small IRA, have it outright to the child. But if it's a big IRA, we want to make sure to protect it if that's what you want to do. Okay, so one of the things, so this is just a little schematic of it. An IRA, the beneficiary is the trust. That means the minimum distributions go into the trust each year, and the trust can be for the benefit of your spouse or your kids. Okay, in order for an IRA to be valid, it has uh, to work for an, for to be a beneficiary of an IRA. There's four specific uh, requirements. They and it's virtually impossible to screw these up. Um, again, we're going to do it because we want to put it into a uh, trust for the spouse. So we make sure the money goes to our kids, not the spouse's next kids. We want to do it for special needs or because someone can't spend the money. And then the other reason is charity. If I put, if I have my IRA paid to a charitable trust, then the IRA you never pay income tax on the IRA. It goes into the charitable trust, which pays your child an income stream for his or her life. And then when that child dies, it goes to charity. If you have charitable intent, this is a great thing to do. If you don't have charitable intent, it's a horrible thing to do. So the first step with any client is understanding what they want to accomplish in their estate plan. Do they want to control the money? Do they want to protect the money? Do they want to give it to charity? Do they want to give it to grandchildren? Do they want to give it to some, a, a sibling or someone else? What type of control do they want? I just met with someone and I said, there's really three important questions to ask you in estate planning. Just three. And they were, who is going to make medical decisions for you if you can't? Second important question is, who is going to make financial decisions for you if you're dead or you can't? While you're alive, that person's called the power of attorney. When you're dead, that person's called the trustee or a personal representative. And I said, the third important question is, how do you want to give your money to your children when you die? Do you want to give it to them outright? Or do you want to put it into a trust to protect them in case there's a bad marriage or credit or a bankruptcy or something like that? She said, yes, that's what I want to do. So her IRA is going to be paid to an irrevocable trust for each of her kids. Our other assets are going to be owned by a revocable trust. And when she dies, that money will go into the same trust for the kids because you can do that. Makes it simpler. One trust. OK, now, when we do IRA trust, there's actually two types. One is called the conduit trust. One's called an accumulation trust. A conduit trust basically says as the minimum distribution comes into the trust, Pay it out to the beneficiary. 
comes in, comes out. An accumulation trust is when we are allowed to accumulate the RMDs, the required minimum distributions inside of the trust. And it's more like a discretionary trust. It's, it provides stronger asset protection. And this is the type of trust you're gonna do if you wanna protect the money or usually if you wanna control the money. Conduit trusts are, in my practice, are very rarely used because they don't work for most clients' goals and desires. Okay, some very common mistakes, okay? When we have IRAs paid to trust. Okay, and I've seen all of these in there. I've seen all these happen. One, he, he, the, the trust says, pay it to my child while he's alive. When he dies, give it to my favorite charity. That fails. The money has to come out pretty much immediately. Two, you say, uh, when I die, my IRAs go into my estate. Bad idea, okay? It means it has to come out pretty much immediately. You can have a, you can give your child inside of the IRA trust a very, very broad power to direct where the money goes to anyone in the world he wants, including a charity. Bad idea. You, there's some information requirement you have to give. If you miss that, you have a bad lawyer. Um, uh, you make a lump sum distribution to the trust, could be a problem because then you're going to pay all the income tax in one stage. Under the current rules, you either want to pay it over um, the 10-year period of time or wait to the end of the 10 years and then make a payment. Um, so those are some of the problems that have made. Special needs trust. So if you have a child who has special needs, that child needs a trust for their inheritance. Um, otherwise, um, they may not qualify for certain government benefits, but you can have more than enough money for your special needs child um, so that they would never ever apply for gov need-based government benefit assistance. And that's really what you want to do. You really don't want your child to apply for that because you'd rather them have enough money so they can pay for their own health insurance, their own food, their own housing. Um, so you would, you would do a trust for that special needs child, but it wouldn't have the same sorts of um, restrictions that a pure special needs trust would have. Um, so, what we're doing right now is going to have a very broad discretionary distribution standard. So in other words, the trustee can pay the money to the beneficiary for any purpose whatsoever. Um, but we're going to make sure that the trustee can use it to pay for a money manager if they, you want to help control the money, or maybe a caregiver to take them to doctors, or maybe just a friend to accompany them on vacations or to the ball game, or to the theater, okay? So you have to specifically allow for those things. So there are things called first party special needs trusts. That's when someone has assets of their own and they have to acquire for government care. It's usually after a lawsuit um, or someone got hurt after they've been working for a number of years. You wanna create a first party special needs trust uh, there's some very specific guidelines about those. And the, and, the, and the downside is that when the beneficiary dies, you got to pay back the state of Maryland or whatever state you live in for any money they paid for that beneficiary. A third party special needs trust is one that you create for someone. And there's no requirement to reimburse the state or Medicaid. You don't need any sort of really particular definition of disability, and you can do it at any age. Okay, all you got to do is make sure that the beneficiary doesn't have control. That's it. Spendthrift trusts are pretty similar. You have a beneficiary who can't control their spending. Okay, I am sure of the fifteen or sixteen people on this call 
one of you may have a child or beneficiary who fits this definition. And so you want to give full authority for the distributions vested with some sort of third party trustee. It could be another child of yours, though we don't recommend it, and it can be an independent trustee. And basically, in this way, creditors can't reach it. Um, you can, they can't be scammed. They can't be, um, you know, I mean, the worst thing that happens is you give money, $300,000 to your daughter, who is susceptible to being taken advantage of. You gotta protect it. This is how you protect it. There's a downside. And the, and the downside of all sorts of your railroad trusts are almost all the same. One, it needs to file a tax return. Two, income taxes could be higher or lower because there's a trust involved. And three, if you have an independent trustee, the trustee will get paid. Now, people sometimes get really upset about that or say, oh, I'm not going to do a trust for that reason. And then I say, well, what's better? Giving your child a half a million dollars or a million dollars or, or $2 million and having that money gone within six months or giving your child an income stream for the rest of their life and the cost of that is an income tax return and paying someone to be the trustee. What's better for your child in the long run? Generally, it's going to be the income stream. And then people, then the next question clients ask me is, well, is the beneficiary going to be upset about that? And my answer is usually not. Most of the beneficiaries who I know who get income streams, whether I'm the trustee or someone else is the trustee and they get an income stream, after a, a year or so, they're really fine with it. They're fine with it because they don't have any responsibility. They don't have to worry about the investments. They don't have to worry about the taxes. All they get is a payment every month for doing nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, protective trusts versus discretionary trusts. Okay, again, a discretionary trust is when an independent trustee is given full discretion over distributions. Uh, sometimes there'll be a standard. Okay, if there's a standard, like an ascertainable standard, uh, which allows the beneficiary to distribute to themselves with a health education maintenance support, then you can have the beneficiary serve as a trustee and the money will still be excluded from that beneficiary's creditors, won't be included in the beneficiary's estate, and it will preserve the trust assets and be protected. Okay, so sometimes we want a dis purely discretionary trust. Sometimes we want one with a ascertainable standard. What we really want to do is we want to merge the two together. And so most of my clients, when they're creating a protective trust for their child, when their child is mature and responsible, we basically say the beneficiary is the trustee. And the beneficiary or the trustees can distribute to the child and the child's children for health, education, maintenance, support, and therefore the creditors can't reach it. And then we allow the beneficiary to appoint an independent trustee who can make a distribution to the beneficiary for any reason whatsoever. And clients sort of ask me why. And I say, well, this is all a game. And they look at me strangely and I say, well, it's a game because what happens is your child is getting divorced or your child is getting sued or your child has a creditor. And that person sues your child. And they either go settle the case or they go into a trial in court. 
And then there's usually a judge who's going to make a decision. And the question is, what is that judge making the decision on? Okay. Judges in the local state courts sometimes do not know the law. So we have an independent trustee because if someone gets into trouble, what they should do is say, okay, I'm going to resign as trustee. I'm going to name my best friend or I'm going to name my accountant or my lawyer as the trustee. And now I have no control over it. And therefore, it's more likely that a judge is going to say it can't be reached. Even though the law says... If the benefit is a trustee, it can't be reached. It's more likely to happen if there's an independent trustee. And then most of my clients will let the beneficiary decide who gets the money when they die. You've probably heard this term dynasty trust or generation skipping trust. And that's what we've been talking about. A dynasty trust is a more fancy term for a trust that goes, that lasts for your child's lifetime and then can go for your grandchild's, great-grandchild's, and great-grandchild's lives. I mean, I just, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm working with someone right now. And what I, what I, what we said, what I told them is, okay, if you take this money, okay, he's selling his business, and he's going to get $10 million. And I say, if you take this money and you give it to your kids now, because he doesn't need it, and that money grows during your kid's lifetime, and let's say it grows from $10 million to $30 million. And then when your kids die, it stays in trust for your grandkids, and it keeps growing. And it's never going to be subject to a, a transfer tax. Currently, the transfer tax number is $11,700,000 for each person or $23,400,000 for a married couple. Congress is likely to change that. I heard that they're going to propose a $4.9 trillion income tax raising bill in Congress. And that $4.9 trillion is going to have to be raised by doing a number of tax increases uh, on corporations, on individuals, and on people who die. Everything's going to have to be raised to generate $4.9 trillion. And, I, and I'm not going to tell you whether that's going to be beneficial for the economy or worse for the economy. I'm just saying that if you want to raise that much money, everyone's going to get stuck. And so likely, the amount that passes free of estate tax is going to go down. Maybe to three million, maybe to five million. Uh, Bernie Sanders would like it down to one million. And this is just a chart that will tell you how much tax can be paid over time. There's a trust that's called the Spousal Limited uh, Lifetime Access Trust, or a SLAT for short. I hate that term SLAT. But basically, what this is. It's where I, as a spouse, take my own money and put it into a trust for my, my spouse, in my case, my wife, where my wife can use the money during her lifetime. And when she dies, there'll be no estate tax. She can probably, I can probably give her a power to make sure I can become a beneficiary when she dies. It's protected from her creditors because I made the gift to her. It's protected from my creditors after a period of time. And it's outside of our estates, our kids' estates, our grandkids' estates, everyone's estates. Okay? So we have clients who are doing this now if they believe that they may end up with an estate tax when they die and they want to use up their exemption today. 
Okay. So what we've done is we've talked about we've talked about um, revocable trusts and irrevocable trusts. A revocable trust is a trust that is used to avoid probate when you die and to help manage assets while you're alive and to make it simpler, easier, less costly, less hassle when you die. It's especially important if you have real estate in more than one state. It's especially important if you have lots of assets. It's especially important if you have people who may be fighting when you die. And it's especially important if you just wanna make it easier for your heirs. And then irrevocable trusts. And the first thing to know about an irrevocable trust is that it's a trust that the words can't be changed. But as I told you, you can change the words under circumstances in different ways. So they're irrevocable, but as I like to say, but they can be changed with cost and difficulty, okay? And why would you do an irrevocable trust? You would do an irrevocable trust for um, to avoid a tax. It could be an income tax. It could be an estate tax. It could be a gift tax. It could be something called the generation skipping tax. Or you want to do it to control the money. You have a child who has special needs. You have a child who spends money. You have a child who has a drug or a gambling problem. You have a child who you hate their spouse. You have a child who um, um, just wants to sit around and play video games. Whatever it is, you want to control the money so that the money will be there for the rest of that child's life. Or you're going to do an irrevocable trust to protect the inheritance or the gift. You're going to protect it from the beneficiaries, creditors, pre creditors, lawsuits, bankruptcies, bad marriages, nursing homes, future estate taxes. That's why you're going to do an irrevocable trust. Those are the benefits. What are the cons, the disadvantages? Again, well, it costs money to draft. I don't think that's a disadvantage, but, it's, but you may think it's a disadvantage. Two, you have to title the assets in, in what you want to do. And that's not really a disadvantage. It's something that has to be done. Three, it requires a tax return. Four, the income taxes on the money earned by the irrevocable trust could have could be have, have be a greater income tax than if the money was just given to the beneficiary, but sometimes it could be the same or it could be less. So there really isn't much of a disadvantage to doing an irrevocable trust for your beneficiary if you need to protect the assets or you want to control the assets. And then we talked about different types of irrevocable trusts. One's for IRAs. Um, again, more about special needs, more about protective trusts. And finally, a SLAT, which is a trust to help use up your exemption while you're alive. Um, this was the first time I'd done this presentation. And obviously, um, and I can tell you when I, I've done a number of presentations by Zoom, they go faster than when I'm live. I tell more stories when I'm live with people than on Zoom um, because I don't have an audience and I don't know, I can't see anyone. So it's difficult, um, but I can take it. I'm gonna take questions now. Um, and so why don't you ask me questions? Uh, you can put them in the chat. Um, and let's see, how do I get the chat for participants? I don't know. Or I don't know if you can unzoom yourself. Maybe this is it. Okay, here we go. Um, the question is, are parents revocable trust instructs that their properties get sold upon their passing and split between my sister and I? Is that income from the sales taxable to my sister and I? If so, how can it be avoided? Um, okay, great question. 
So first off, current law says when someone dies, their assets get a new basis, which means that if you sell the asset when your parents die, at the fair market value of when the parents died, so let's say the house was worth 400,000 when they died and you sell it for $400,000, there's, no there's no tax whatsoever. No capital gains tax whatsoever, okay? Now, I can tell you that one of President Biden's um, tax proposals is to eliminate that stepped up basis at death. I don't know what Congress is going to do. Now, the next question is, so can you keep the properties after your parents die if the trust says it must be sold? So my first comment is going to be, I've never, the only time I've seen you must sell a property when someone dies is when the property really should be sold. Most of the time, the trustee, the person in charge has discretion to do that. Um, but if it does say it must get sold, then it needs to be changed so that it can be sold or not sold depending on what you want to do. And if you want to keep it for an income stream after they die, okay, then you should specifically make that happen inside of the documents. Okay, um, and then you need to have it done in a way so to protect you from liabilities of the properties, um, liability um, from creditors of the properties. Um, and sometimes you're gonna do that by having the properties end up in what's called the limited liability company. It sounds like your parents' revocable trust needs to be reviewed to make sure it's going to accomplish what you and they want it to accomplish. And that also adds another question, which pretty much is, how often do you have to review these documents? And my answer is, Uh, my answer is, um, I think people should review these documents at a minimum every five years, more likely every four years, or if something changes, okay? Um, many of my clients I see every four to five years for many years. Okay, someone asked a question about, is there any advantage to what's called a crummy trust? Okay, I didn't mention crummy trusts inside of my slides because that's not necessarily important. What the, what the question is really asking is, is there any advantage to making gifts while you're alive into an irrevocable trust for the benefit of your beneficiaries? And yes, you want to do that if you need to do that to avoid or minimize a tax. It can be an estate tax. It can be a um, income tax. Sometimes in those trusts is a power of withdrawal. And the reason why there's this power of withdrawal, which this person called a crummy trust, is because um, we want to make the gift be not subject to income, um, to gift tax, all right? Um, so there are advantages. Um, they can be pretty cool advantages. Um, it all depends upon what someone's trying to accomplish. Again, everyone's estate plan is different. Everyone's is different and deserves a different estate plan and deserves someone to listen to their goals, their objectives, their family situation, and draft the right estate plan and recommend the right estate plan, okay? That's what we do every day. So the next question was, if a couple has a Maryland trust, but they move to Florida, do they need to have a Florida attorney review, revise their trust? 
And my answer would be yes. Now, we are we have attorneys licensed in Florida. We actually have three attorneys licensed for and we have an attorney licensed in Florida who who has an office in Florida. <clears throat> there, there, there are a, a number of significant differences between Maryland and Florida, so that it's important to revise the documents. What's also important is if you want to make Florida your residence for income tax purposes, one of the indices of that is your state documents. So every time we have a client move to Florida, we change their documents to say that they're now Florida residents and their power of attorney and their medical directive changes. And there are certain other provisions. All right. I have another question. Uh, which is what do you how do you what do you tell people of limited resources assets? Many people feel they don't have much, so why bother with all this? Is it worth it? Wow. I guess the answer to that question is: if someone wants to leave their assets directly to their kids, and the assets aren't significant, then they can probably do it simply buy an online program, or in some way that's very simple. But if they don't want to do that, they need someone like me, okay? I actually had a client come in this week who has $350,000. And I typically wouldn't someone like that wouldn't really be able to afford me, but she had some very specific desires in how she wanted to leave her money. One, she wanted a revocable trust to make it easier for her kids. And two, she actually wanted to give more to one kid and less to another kid. And if you're gonna do that, you better do it through someone like me so that we can make sure it's gonna work when someone dies, okay? But otherwise, there are some good programs out there. You know, you have one kid or two kids, they're, not, they're gonna get along, you think they're gonna get along, you're gonna give the money outright to them. You don't wanna pay a lawyer thousands of dollars, okay, go do it online. But if your kid has any problems, if you're not leaving it equally to your kids, if you want to protect your kids or you want to or you have a child with some sort of problems, don't do it online. No matter what you have, it's worth protecting it. It's absolutely worth protecting it. I mean, we I mean, we were talking to someone yesterday, and again, I, this was someone's inheriting fifty thousand dollars and they have an income tax problem. And they want to protect, yeah, they, and they have an income tax problem. So if they inherit the money, it's going to go to the IRS. So they want to get it into an irrevocable trust before they inherit it. Okay, but it was $50,000. Was it worth it? Well, here's the simple question. If, if she inherits it outright, the 50000 goes to the IRS. So she ends up with zero. If she pays, let's say $3,000 to draft an irrevocable trust, she ends up with 47,000. What's better, zero or $47,000? Years ago, we had someone die and uh, one of the beneficiaries inheriting the money had special needs. And if they inherited money, it was going to go all to the state of Maryland, 100%. So what did they do? We did a first party special needs trust. Granted, it cost you know, a lot uh, more money than they wanted to spend. But this answer, this, the answer was simple. 
either the, either there's forty thousand or fifty thousand for the person to inherit and spend for their needs and for their vacations and for their clothes, or zero. What's better? Okay, you know. So sometimes it's worth spending the money even with limited resources or assets. Are there any other questions? I don't think I have any other questions. I'm going to receive twenty thousand from a divorce as penalty income. Um, is there any way I can see that protects it? The question would be protected from what? Okay. If you want to protect it from something bad that can happen in the future, and all you got is 20000 to protect, I would think about putting it in, trying to get it into an IRA retirement account or into an annuity product or a life insurance product. Okay? Um, so there are some ways you can protect it. Again, life insurance, annuities, retirement accounts are protected from credits if that's what you're trying to protect. If you're trying to protect it from income taxes, can't be done. If you're trying to protect it from your current bankruptcy, if you, that, that's what was happening, um, I'm not sure anything can be done, but it'd be worth talking to someone about it. Any other questions? Um, and I guess we're done. Um, my, my, my last slide had my contact information. Um, I'm just going to give you my phone number and my email address in case anyone wants to contact me. My phone number is 301 468 3220. 301 468 3220. And my um, email, well, if you just Google Gary Altman, you'll find me. Gary Altman, A L T M A N. Very easy to find me on Google. There was one last question about do 529 plans protect assets? And the answer is yes, they do. Um, but it sometimes depends upon who's the owner of the plan. Again, it's an interesting question. I'd be glad to talk to anyone about it offline. If anyone wants to send me an email and ask me a question privately, please do. And thank you very much. Please go home, have dinner, and everyone stay safe. Thank you.